thank you for coming. Um, um, this uh, event is sponsored by the Al Walid bin Talal Center for American Studies and Research. And uh, we welcome you to this presentation by Professor Mustafa Bayoumi. Um, before I introduce him, I'd just like to remind you that we'll also have another presentation on Monday, October 9th um, in Building 37 in the conference room. Um, our speaker will be Walter Johnson from Harvard University, and he'll be speaking on, no, the title of his talk will be, No Rights Which the White Man Was Bound to Respect, Racial, Racial Capitalism and Empire in the Age of Fred Scott. So um, it's uh, interesting because it's about uh, the city of St. Louis, um, and we know that Missouri has been the site of ongoing you know, racial tension lately. So it should be very interesting. So Mustafa Bayoumi is uh, a member of the Center Center's International Advisory Board. I'll mention that first. <laughs> So he's the author of a critically acclaimed book uh, titled, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? Being Young and Arab in America, uh, published by Penguin Books. Um, it won an American Book Award and the Arab American Book Award for nonfiction. Uh, the book also has been translated into Arabic uh, by Arab scientific publishers. His uh, newest book, is entitled This Muslim American Life, Dispatches from the War on Terror, from NYU Press. Um, it was chosen as the best book of 2015 by the Progressive Magazine and was also awarded the Arab American Book Award for nonfiction. Uh, Dr. Bayoumi is a professor of English at Brooklyn College of City University of New York and um, he's also an accomplished journalist. So you may see his work in The Guardian, New York Times Magazine, um, and he often publishes uh, essays on Arab American uh, and Muslim American issues. Um, so please welcome Professor Bayoumi. Um, Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this a press conference? I'm not sure. It's like, well, good afternoon. I'm very delighted to be here and to talk to you all this afternoon. And um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Professor Khoury for the invitation to come here and speak to you, as well as Professor Zanger and uh, Dean Sheikh. It's really a, a, a great honor. And, uh, uh, and it's a pleasure to see the, uh, the Center for uh, American Studies and Research uh, uh, you know, be active and, and, and fulfill its mission uh, in its entirety, and I look forward to, uh, to uh, the greater um, programming of that, of that very important center on this campus. I am here to talk to you today um, about my book, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? This is actually a copy of the book right here. And this book, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem, is now about just over nine years old. And the, um, the publisher has asked me to write a small uh, um, uh, essay for the 10th anniversary of the book. And so next year, there will be a 10th anniversary edition of this book, which in some ways is really great news, because not many books get you know, re-published uh, uh, in the 10th anniversary edition. It means the book has had a measure of success. I think that that's all very good. Uh, but in other ways, it's actually terrible news. It's terrible news. When I, think, I think that when I first published How Does It Feel to Be a Problem, the book, uh, uh, what I had hoped for this book was that I was writing a book that was about a very contemporary moment, those years from around 2001, from the, the moment of the terrorist attacks of 2001 in the United States, to the time of the book's publication, or just prior to the publication. And what I was hoping to do, I think, at that time, was kind of chronicle an era, uh, one that would be a very contemporary moment, a book that would appear, I, I would have assumed, in the current affairs section of the bookstore, and then, I would have hoped, would, be very, would very quickly move 
to essentially the history part of the bookstore. Uh, and unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. It stayed in the current affairs section. In fact, I think the book has had uh, almost, you could say, a second life, but it, in fact, it's been, it's been constant all the way through, constantly growing. Um, people are surprised by its relevance today uh, compared to the time when it was even published. So it's almost like I wrote a chronicle of the future, in fact, when I wrote this book, something I had not intended to write. The reasons why I began writing How Does It Feel to Be a Problem was essentially having lived in New York City for many years prior to 9-11 and after 9-11 was because I was seeing the kinds of uh, progressive dehumanizations around me and certainly in the cultural sphere and in the political sphere of the United States. The progressive dehumanization of Arab and Muslim populations in the country most notably through different law enforcement practices, through different media representations. Uh, and I was feeling it, my friends were feeling it, we were, all, we were all very cognizant that this was a very intense, very heady, very important time, very difficult time. And at the same time, we were not actually seeing a lot of those experiences represented in the media uh, around us. So there came a time when I thought, you know, I should maybe just, instead of looking for those representations, maybe it should be incumbent upon me, uh, if I can, to try to produce them instead. There's a kind of writerly cliche that says that you write the book that you want to read, which is exactly what I ended up doing. I wrote the book that I wanted to read. Actually, I actually haven't read the book since I wrote it, but now I'll have to reread it now in order to write the introduction. But at any rate, uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't only my sense that there was this progressive dehumanization happening either. Because if you look at the polling data, you can see that my, my fears were well founded. For example, in, starting in 2001, the Washington Post ABC News Group added some questions to their surveys. Because they regularly and routinely survey the American public on a variety of different questions to get the thermometer, to gauge the, the temperature of the public on various issues. So starting in 2001, they started adding certain questions. And some of those questions were things like, do you personally harbor any prejudice towards Islam and Muslims? Or do you have negative feelings towards Islam and these sorts of things? And those questions in 2001, they garnered around a 39% uh, uh, yes. So that's you know, more than a third of the population essentially was admitting to harboring prejudice uh, towards Arabs and Muslims back in 2001. What happened after 2001, which is perhaps somewhat surprising, but those numbers in fact dipped for a few years. They went down. And it was only around 2005 and 2006, essentially when the war in Iraq started going very badly, that those numbers started to rise up again. By the time we hit 2010, those numbers were now around 49%. So about half of the population would admit to harboring prejudice and having negative sentiments and feelings towards particularly Islam and Muslims at that point. And then, the, for some reason, I don't know why, but they seem to have dropped the question from their survey. But other survey data will confirm the same findings and, in fact, see that, it's, that, that escalating trend has continued. So, for example, in the summer of 2010, because their 2010 question was prior to the summer, but the summer of 2010 was when we saw the ground zero mosque controversy. I don't know if people recall that. So uh, The Economist magazine did a survey around then, and they asked the same kinds of questions. They found that 55% of the American public was opposed to uh, the Islam and Muslims. And then um, another survey uh, from 2015 asked exactly the same question as the Washington Post, and they found that it was now 58%. So all, more than half the population closing in on two-thirds. And in fact, the, the, uh, the Pew has asked similar kinds of questions, the Pew Forum on Religion, and they found that similar findings, and they have also found interesting uh, sub-findings within that, which is among evangelical Christians and, and uh, Republicans, identified Republicans, that number, the, there's about 67 for evangelical Christians and 68% for identified Republicans would say that Islam is not part of mainstream American society. And um, uh, also, interestingly, still to this day, the majority of Americans have never met a Muslim. Okay, so all of that indicates this kind of increasing, this, this uh, 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 progressive dehumanization. And I started thinking about this at the time, and I've been thinking about it even more, I guess, of late, too. And I've come to the conclusion uh, recently 
that in fact, um, that Muslim Americans didn't exist in the United States until after 2001. Now this seems like a foolish statement. It's a foolish idea because the evidence, of course, is plainly evident that Islam has been in the United States for a very long time, since the colonial era, in fact. In fact, it's very clear that the history of Islam in the United States is much, much longer than the history of Donald Trump and his family in the United States, as an example. Uh, among the first slave statutes in the United States, for example, this is, this is the time of the colonial era, and among the fir very first slave statutes in 1682 was an act in Virginia which stated that those who could be enslaved in the country, and this is what the act says, are Negroes, Moors, Mulattoes, and others born of and in heathenish, idolatrous, pagan, and Mohammedan parentage and country. Right. By the 18th century, historians will tell us that in colonial South Carolina, uh, you know, in South Carolina, there were times when there was a black majority in South Carolina, when there were more people of African descent than people of European descent. And historians will tell us that during that period in South Carolina, having looked through, combed through all of the census data and the different kinds of uh, uh, data that the government had, one line struck out to me in particular. One historian has found that in colonial South Carolina, Mustafa was a fairly common name. That's my name. Okay. <laughs> Uh, or in the 19th century, for example, we have the case, this is relatively well known uh, among, among certain crowds and completely unknown among others. But for example, in the 19th century, we have many examples of people of African descent who had come to the United States, people from Africa come to the United States to be enslaved and enslaved. And here's one example of a man whose name was Omar ibn Said. And he had come from West Africa, uh, was enslaved in uh, North Carolina, right? ran away from an uh, a very brutal uh, overseer on the plantation where he was meant to work, and uh, was found praying in the woods, having run away. He was uh, a little boy, was playing in the woods, and came across this man who was praying in the woods in Muslim style, Muslim fashion, and the boy went to the village and ran and told the people in the village what was happening. The people in the village, of course, came and uh, arrested Amr ibn Said as a runaway slave. And they, they didn't know exactly who he was or, who or uh, which, from which uh, family he had run away from, so they threw him in the local county jail. This is all, I'm telling you this story, relating it all from contemporary, uh, from the time period, contemporary media reports. So they threw him in the county jail. And in the county jail, he was lost and forlorn, what they say, and he was sad and, and sitting by himself. There had been a fire in the jail earlier, like a, a local fire to keep things warm, uh, just in the corner of his cell and that it had burned down. And so by the time that he was there, there were just coal embers left in the corner of the cell. He actually picks up some of these coal embers and he starts to scrawl language across all four walls of his jail cell. And this, I should remind you, is a time when in many parts of the United States, it was considered impossible and also illegal for slaves to read and write, English in particular. Then the, his uh, captors come up, to the, uh, come up to, the slave, to the cell and they look at this and they have no idea what language it is that he's writing in. And they have no idea that he could even write. They're looking at this, this magical thing in front of them and they say to themselves or to each other that he must be a conjurer. This becomes the name. So of course, what do they do? They run to the local university and get a professor to come from the local university. And the professor looks at this magical language and says, oh, well, that's Arabic. And they're shocked. They're shocked that a man could be writing Arabic. In fact, a black man could be writing Arabic. They're so shocked that a black man could be writing Arabic that it's very interesting to read these media accounts because immediately then he starts to become, he becomes referred to as an Arab instead of an African. 
But uh, at that point, he becomes a bit of a novelty in his society. And then another family comes, and they actually purchase him from the previous family. And he lives with this other family for a while in a much nicer, as in not as brutal situation, although it's still slavery. And at that time, this family had a great interest in Omar ibn Said because they, too, were connected to the American Bible Society. And they were very fascinated and interested, in fact, proselytizing with Arabic Bibles to West Africa. So they had their own reasons as well. But this is an interesting and amazing part of American history, one that I think most Americans don't know about. Right? The fact that American history is, is deeply inclusive of an Islamic component. Here's even another example I can give you from Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. This is the autobiography of Booker T. where he recounts in his 1901 book visiting an unnamed town that was on the brink of killing a black man. Why? This dark-skinned man had committed the unspeakable crime of stopping at the town's local hotel. This was during Jim Crow, of course, of racial segregation and deadly racial violence. So a black person had to know where to go and where not to go. Otherwise, merely stopping at a hotel could become a life-threatening act. Washington tells us that the man's presence so angered the local white population that, quote, it seemed likely for a time that there would be a lynching. And yet the man was spared. The townspeople soon found out that the man was not an American Negro, as Washington writes, after all, but in fact that he was a, quote, a citizen of Morocco, who spoke English. Washington then, then informs us that, quote, the man who was the innocent cause of the excitement, because after they found out that he was like this Moroccan, he is not actually uh, African American, then they were like, oh, okay, okay, fine, you know, no problem. No problem at that point. And so then at that point, Washington writes, all the signs of indignation disappeared. Washington then informs us that, quote, the man who was the innocent cause of the excitement, though, found it prudent after that not to speak English. Imagine, there was a time when being Moroccan and not speaking English would save your life in the United States. So, but we have this long, rich history of different various migrations, not, of course, not only uh, limited to what I've described so far, but also, naturally, the Arab migrations to the United States, the South Asian migrations to the United States, mostly beginning in the 19th century and continuing at least until 1924 when they generally slow down and then start up again in 1965. So what must I be smoking when I say that Muslim Americans didn't exist in the country until 2001? Well, I think that Muslim Americans generally were seen as a subset of other groups, primarily, though not exclusively, African Americans prior to 2001. If in mainstream dialogue people talked about the Muslims, say, in the 1950s, who would they be referring to? They would be referring to the Nation of Islam. The nation preferred, in fact, to call themselves just Muslims, but the general public called them black Muslims, something that Malcolm X himself hated who said that the black Muslim label stuck after C. Eric Lincoln's book of the same name. You know, we are not black Muslims, he would say. We are Muslims who happen to be black. Before 9-11, the domestic association with Islam and Muslims in the United States would be primarily, essentially, through African-American culture, though not exclusively. But discursively, I think that when we talk about uh, our, which means when we talk about our concepts, the way we talk about our concepts and organize our institutions, Discursively, there has of late come into existence, I would argue, the invention of a brand new category, the Muslim American, separated out from these subsets. It's its own category now, Muslim American. The Muslim American is often talked about as if she or he is, a, is separate from other groups and identities, regardless of the fact that Muslims in the United States today come from 77 different countries of origin with all kinds of different moments of arrival, different histories, different trajectories, some are very wealthy, some are very poor, some are refugees, some are immediate revivals, some have lived here for a long time, some date back all the way to the days of slavery, etc. So I think, in fact, what I'm trying to argue, maybe it's not even a difficult uh, concept to, to grasp, but I think it's an important one to grasp nonetheless, which is the ways in which Muslim American-ness has in fact assumed, is, has been created out of our post 9-11 reality. And in many ways, this is a political reality, a political question that reminds me, 
in many ways, of Franz Fanon and his work. In reverse, perhaps. Fanon writes that, in The Wretched of the Earth, he writes that the colonist and the colonizer are old acquaintances. And consequently, the colonist is right when he says he knows them, Fanon writes. It is the colonist who fabricated and continues to fabricate the colonial subject. The colonized derives his validity, i.e. his wealth, from the colonial system. So Fanon's thinking about Algeria in his situation, of course, and he's really essentially talking about a kind of Hegelian dialectic. Fanon was a, a big Hegelian in, in, in his thought. And he's thinking about, in a, in a sense, the way in which the Hegelian dialectic creates the settler and creates the native. Before the settler arrived, there were no natives in Algeria. There were just people in Algeria. It's that the arrival of the settler creates the concept of the native in that relationship between the two. Right? And I think that we see something important happening also with regards to Muslim Americans. Um, they also are existing in a kind of dialectical relationship with the U.S. mainstream public now. The U.S. mainstream public and Muslim Americans are new rather than old acquaintances, but the public still gains something, especially the politics of the United States still gain something from this relationship. Now, I'm not saying that the creation of Muslim Americans was a plot or something nefarious. On the contrary, it was often done with the best intentions and out of ways of trying to understand the events of 9-11 and also different political Islamic movements around the world. Though discursively, what such creations, such as the Muslim Americans and even Muslims do, is to occlude that history and ultimate culpability of how these movements arose, putting everything and explaining all history and actions, of course, through the idea of Islam, something that we're very familiar with, especially with the work of Edward Said. And I think many Muslims can be just as guilty of this narrative as well. But nevertheless, the Muslim American has been created. It's a new version of America, a new version of an American, and, uh, and a new version of a vulnerable American. And I think it's a rare, actually, to live through the creation of a new category. And this is something that I think we should be thinking about. And it's something that, in fact, was very alive, even at the time when I was considering writing my book. I think we, that was what was happening right at that moment. There was this creation of this new category. In the beginning, when this category was first being uh, formed, I guess you could say, in a kind of larger political unconscious of the United States, it had a slightly different name. Back then, people used to refer to it as Arab and Muslim. Right? Slowly over these years, it's transformed from Arab and Muslim primarily. You still see that locution, but now the Arab and has largely dropped away, and it's become mostly just Muslim. <clears throat> and that became really an interesting and uh, important thing for me to consider, not only because this is a new ideological and kind of mythological construct, but also because these kinds of ideological constructs, this idea of the Arab and Muslim, whatever it is, or the idea of the Muslim American, However mythological and ideological they are, they will, of course, have real-world consequences for people uh, around the country and around the world. And that was what was interesting to me. What I really wanted to do was try to investigate what that would mean for especially young Arab uh, Muslim Americans. And so at one point, and then I thought, OK, I'm going to write this book. I want to write a book that counters this idea of this progressive dehumanization that I'm seeing happening in front of me, that we're all seeing happening in front of us. And so the best way I thought to do that would be, rather than countering a, a kind of force of a stereotype with another sort of abstract concept, I thought I wanted to make the, the book as concrete as possible, label it, uh, place it in as a very specific geography, talk about a very specific community. And as I was saying, Muslim Americans, which come, who come from 77 different countries of origin, that's a really hard category, actually, to talk about, in part because it is, this, uh, in some ways, this abstract category. So I thought instead what I would do was I would focus all my energies on talking about young, uh, uh, talking about Arabs in particular, and Arab Muslims primarily as my category, and also talking about young people within that group. Primarily, I thought I wanted to write about young people, too, because you know, I know what it's like to grow up as a young person. I, I was one at one point. Uh, I was a young Arab and a young Muslim in uh, Canada at a different time. 
And, you know, while, yes, we still had the, uh, uh, I was still called all kinds of names, you know, like you know, terrorist, et cetera, et cetera, growing up, I'm sure we were all familiar with some of those things. Uh, I felt that it was very different when you suddenly had a sort of a large scale hostility of a society falling on your shoulders after the 9-11 attacks. So I thought that would be really an interesting uh, place to look, just to see what was happening to these young people and their, and their anxieties, their realities, their lives. So I decided I would, I would talk to young people, talk to Arab Americans, primarily Arab Muslim Americans, and I thought the location that I would use would be Brooklyn, New York. And I chose Brooklyn, not Dearborn, and I, not, uh, but Brooklyn, because, for a couple of reasons. One, I live in Brooklyn, so it's easy, so I didn't have to move. Uh, but also because Brooklyn was, A, it was in the shadows of the, uh, of the attack, right? B, Brooklyn is a place where no single group really dominates. And so the, the, in, in many ways, that will eventually become the future of the United States, I think. Right? As, whereas in Dearborn, you'd have a very different character to this kind of book. Uh, and in fact, there are more, believe it or not, at least according to official data from the 2000 census, there are more, which was the census I was using when I was writing the book, there were more Arabs in, um, in uh, New York City than there were in any other city in the United States. And then within New York City, there are more Arabs in Brooklyn than there were in any other borough in the United States. Uh, and within Brooklyn, there were more Arabs than even in Dearborn. So Dearborn, take that, all right? So, okay. um, so I decided I would begin this project. And I knew that there were these stories around me, but I needed to find exactly the people I could talk to in order to, to really delve into what their realities and their lives were like. So what I did was I went to all my friends, I called them up, and I said, I have this project I want to do. Will you, will you help me? And, and uh, I described what I wanted to do. I told them to tell their friends and to tell all of their friends. You know, pretty soon I was getting phone calls from some of my, some, from people. Some guy called me up, some guy I don't know, called me up one day. He's like, you the guy writing the book? I said, yes. He goes, okay, good, because this happened to me on Thursday. Right. And you know, some ind indignity had happened to him on Thursday. I wasn't writing a book about Thursdays, though. I wanted really good stories that I could like, latch my, you know, my writerly teeth onto. And so, but I had I asked my friends to tell their friends, et cetera, et cetera. I went to different community organizations. I went to different mosques around the city. I talked to different legal organizations. I introduced myself. Every single time I went, I was always a little bit nervous because this was a time when there was a lot of state repression, you know, as this continues to be. But there was also, in fact, around the same time, there was a terrorism investigation and trial happening in the Brooklyn community. And I live you know, in a different part than where many of the Arab Americans live in Brooklyn. Not only that, but I came to the United States as a graduate student. I don't have, uh, you know, my family is still in Canada. It's not in Brooklyn, so I don't have these deep family networks. So I was an insider, but I was sort of an outsider at the same time, and I was concerned that they might think that I was, you know, maybe with the police or something, some kind of undercut. So every time I would go to these different mosques and organizations, community organizations, I would always go armed with my articles that I'd already written and say that I'd worked with Edward Said, which was true. So, but I was always very concerned about that. And so later on, I discovered that what I was doing was what sociologists would call, and sorry, can back me up on this, a uh, snowball sample, yes? And so I was trying to figure out exactly who I could talk to and trying to reach out and find as many people that I could talk to. And at first I was concerned that maybe I wouldn't get the right stories, or maybe I would, I just didn't know. Um, <clears throat> and, um, um, but I was starting to feel like I was getting uh, more familiar with the community, and the community was getting more comfortable with me. For example, there was this one time when I went to one of the, the, the mosques. In, uh, I had already introduced myself to the imam of this mosque. I went to this mosque on a Friday prayer, and, uh, and after the prayer concludes, the, uh, the imam immediately sees me. And he's like, ah, oh, Mustafa, I want to talk to you. Will you meet me in my office upstairs? So I said, oh, OK, sure. So uh, I go up to his office. He had some things to do first before he could meet me. So I'm just sitting in his office, just waiting for him. I'm thinking, what's he going to tell me? Is he going to tell me like, a really good story about this project that I'm going to be able to use? Or is he going to actually tell me to get lost because people don't trust me? And I just wasn't sure. And I was drumming my fingers, just wondering and thinking, very nervous and concerned. And finally, he comes in. 
opens the door, walks right past me, sits right down at his desk, pulls out his uh, drawer, op- takes out a little tiny book, flips through the book, and he says, ah, yes, here it is. She's 30 years old. She has a master's degree in chemistry. She's Egyptian. She lives in New Jersey. Do you want to meet her? <laughs> so uh, I thought that was a good sign, I, you know, that there was trust. I, I said, no, you know, thank you, Imam. And he said, hey, I'm Mustafa. Hey, how do I say it? Vespusa. <laughs> But uh, I still said no. And then, uh, uh, but that was a good sign. I thought that was a good sign. And then, for example, there was another good sign, too, that things were moving along, which was uh, uh, not long after that, I got another phone call from one of the, uh, the, the uh, leaders, the community leaders, who had become a friend of mine. He's a small business owner, you know, uh, Palestinian American, very successful. Uh, in terms of small business and very in, in, important in the neighborhood and in the community. In fact, he's a pillar of the community. There's something called the, uh, the uh, Arab Muslim American Federation. And it's made up mostly of different community leaders in Brooklyn. And they, um, most of them are, are uh, lawyers or doctors or small business owners. They're the professional class. Most, almost all, if not all of them, are, are relatively recent immigrants, like within a generation. Uh, and uh, so, and, you know, I knew these people you know, quite well, and I knew, I knew him very well. And uh, he called me up one day, and he said, Mustafa, uh, the, uh, the FBI called. And I said, oh. And he said, yes, the FBI called because they want to have a meeting. I said, well, that's interesting. He said, yes, they want to meet, and they want to meet just with the, the Federation, just the leaders of the Federation. No public, no press, only the leaders. Uh, I said, that that sounds very interesting. He said, do you want to come? I was like, of course, of course I want to come. This could be really interesting material. So I went to this meeting. So we drove down, and it was in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, in this uh, uh, Muslim American society. uh, Previously had been uh, this old Italian banquet hall with like this huge chandelier that almost kisses the floor, you know, the type of place. And like now it's just a big masala with like, you know, vending machines that say no pork products and things like that, right? Anyway, and so... uh, you know, I'm waiting, we're waiting all to go in, and they won't let us in first. The NYPD won't let us in. And because first there's the New York Police Department are just walking all through the building. First, like, they're the people with their flak jackets, the, po- the police officers looking very intimidating, and then it's the community affairs officers who look less intimidating. I guess they're the nice cops, I don't know. And then finally, they let us all in. And um, I learned later on that the reason why there was this delay was because among, with the FBI agents who were all there, was the man who was leading counterterrorism in New York City at that time, or, or in the whole Eastern District. So he was a very important figure in the FBI, and so they had to make sure everything was all secure and everything. And so it was, it, the meeting became even more uh, important to me than I had imagined. And so as we walked in, then the FBI agents were there, and then uh, we arrived. And I have to tell you, I mean, this is the first time I've ever met FBI. And they look exactly like they do in the movies. <laughs> these tall white guys with like buzz cuts and like, you know, they really, they shake your hand really strong and they, and they always say your name, Hi, nice to meet you, Mustafa. And then you're like, Hi. And you're, they all, and they all wore blue suits, except they had one Moroccan agent who wore a brown suit. I kid you not, I don't know why. It was so strange. And, uh, and then we all sit down, you know, and there's like about 12 of them and 12 of us. And they're, they're sitting, the tables have been set up in this like large square formation. But whoever arranged the tables must have thought that the meeting was going to be larger than it was because they were quite far away from, from us. And so then all the community leaders are looking at each other and they're speaking in Arabic and they're saying, why are they so far away? They shouldn't be so far away. No, we've, we should move closer. Yeah, let's move closer. So all at once, the, all the Arabs move, stand up and push all the desks towards the FBI who have this look of fear on their face. They're like, what's going on? It was, I thought it was kind of hilarious. Anyway, and then finally everything calms down and we all sit down and then the, uh, the meeting begins. And then Mark Marchand, who's the, uh, who was the director at the time, then he begins the meeting. And I remember very clearly what he said. And I was taking copious notes, <clears throat> and, he, uh, and he begins, and he says, we've been talking to the Pakistani American Muslim community, we've been talking to the Bangladeshi American Muslim community, and now we want to talk to the Arab American Muslim community. And you can kind of see like bureaucratic imagination also happening there. 
And then he says, and this is verbatim what he said, because I remember it very clearly. He says, you know, we want to instill in these communities that same love for our precious freedoms that we all have. Kind of condescending, if you ask me. And, uh, and the meeting just went down from there, too. And then the next, uh, you know, you're talking to basically the backbone for, for you know, that should be said, of multicultural America that's right in front of you, too. These are successful doctors and lawyers and business people. They, have, they, are, they are the ones who are the foundation of the American society at this point. And so to be talked down to in that fashion was nobody really appreciated it. And then, and then the next question was, so we want to know that if somebody comes to your community and is about to uh, uh, execute a terrorist act, will you report them to the FBI? He actually asks us this, and then we each have to go down, he goes down the line, and we each have to, what are you going to say? You're going to say, no, of course not. So everybody says yes, 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 yes. Get to the imam, the imam says yes in that long imamish way, you know, and then everybody else says yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the meeting just was, it was this, this, um, um, this moment of pure, bad communication between these two different organizations or two different uh, populations. And, and then at one point, uh, the, um, the uh, Muslim community leaders then s speak up and they say, you know, we agreed to come to this meeting because we also have issues. And they're like, okay, let's, let's hear your issues. And they say, well, for example, the no-fly list. Everyone here is familiar with the no-fly list, you know, because there's this list that's at least half a million names long. At one point, even Senator Ted Kennedy, may he rest in peace, was even on that list. And, you know, and as I'm, I don't want to tell this audience, Arab culture is, is a jewel for world civilization. Arab culture is rich and, and beautiful and has so much to offer. But when it comes to names, we tend to repeat the same names a lot, right? So it's easy. How many Ahmed Mustafas do you think there are in Egypt, for example? Yeah, well, uh, or Muhammad's, and yeah, yeah, you get the idea. And so, of course, when it comes to the names uh, on the no-fly list, then it has a real impact for the community. So they said to the, to the FBI leaders, they said, uh, we want to know about the no-fly list. We have a problem with the no-fly list, and it's really impacting people's ability to travel. And this was the answer that the FBI gave. The one of the special agents then says, yes, yes, we know it's a problem. The system is broken. All I can tell you is try to get to the airport early. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the situation. By the time I left, I thought, you know, there's such a bad lack of communication between different segments of American society. But I was actually moving forward in the project. And so by that point, too, it wasn't long after that that I had assembled the, the stories that went into making the book. So I'll give you a very brief uh, example of a few of the stories. <clears throat> Unless everybody here has read the book. How many, any, who has read the book? Okay, that's, that's enough that I'll give you some of this. Thank you. So for example, there's the story of Russia. Russia was, at that time, she was uh, 19 years old. And uh, she had come with her family when she was very young, about five years old, from Syria to the United States. And um, she had come uh, on a tourist visa with her family. And then her family had quickly then applied for asylum as soon as they had arrived in uh, uh, the United States. And, um, and if you know anything about how the asylum laws in particular work in the United States, then you know that they can take years and years uh, to adjudicate. And in Russia's family's case, it took even longer because at one point they left the country and came back. And if you leave, then it's considered that you're abandoning your claim and you have to start up all over again and these sorts of things, right? So Russia was, uh, uh, had still though, she'd spent about 15 years of her life, 14, 15 years of her life at that point, the vast, vast majority of her life in the United States, being educated in the United States. She was living essentially as a, a US person at that point, even though uh, officially her status was somewhere in between. She wasn't really undocumented, but she wasn't fully documented either. In fact, millions of people live in that space every day in the United States. And then about, two, uh, about six months following the 9-11 attacks, 
Um, Rasha and her sister are asleep in their, they share a bedroom. Her father uh, had saved enough money just not long before that to finally buy them. They bought a little house in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. They had uh, tenants in the basement that were helping to, that were renting a room to them that, they, that would help with the, rent, with the payments, the mortgage payments. And the father was very proud of this fact. And he was, he was uh, trying to get the family, you know, um, on their feet and he was doing a good job of it. And so Rasha and her sister were asleep in, uh, in their bedroom. And then early one morning, Rasha feels somebody shaking her, shaking her shoulder. And she wakes up and she looks up and she sees a woman in uniform. And the woman just keeps telling her, she says, wake up, wake up, get up and uh, get dressed and go downstairs. And Rasha thinks, what, 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 what's going on? She's like, get up, get dressed and go downstairs. She won't say anything more than that. And Rasha looks over at her sister and her sister has this look of like, I don't know, on her face. And Rasha thinks, oh my God, somebody must have died. So she, they both get up and they get dressed. They walk downstairs and downstairs, there's already the rest of the family lined up on the, on the sofa, her brother already in chains. And there's men and uh, officials and like with different kinds of uh, uh, law enforcement agency, like an alphabet city of, uh, of different agencies on their jackets, walking around the apartment, lights blaring, and they have no idea what's going on. And then at one point, uh, one of the men who looks like he's more official walks up to them with a clipboard and he says, we know your situation, we know what your status is, and we're also arresting you on suspicion of terrorism. And we're going to actually take you now, down, tonight, we're going to take you uh, uh, and question you at the downtown, and then we're going to um, separate you of the men from the women, and there was a minor as well, and, um, and, and we're going, her brother was a minor, and, uh, and then more than likely you're going to be deported. And yet, during these years, these 15 years that Russia had lived in the United States, she had two other younger brothers who were born in the United States. So they were American citizens. So the authorities were not going to take these young boys who were around four or five years old at this point. And so Russia's father has no idea what's happening. He says, let me call my brother who lives in Chicago. He'll get in his car right now and drive here to take care of my boys. And the authorities said, no, absolutely not. Leave the boys with your tenants downstairs. We're going. So immediately that's what they had to do. They left and they went down to, uh, uh, to the station. And Rasha then says that they, uh, they interrogated each of them individually. Rasha described as a very pro forma kind of interrogation. They had been following them for a little while. There was pictures. They showed them also pictures of other people. They showed them a picture of Osama bin Laden and, and said, do you know him? And Rasha's like, are you serious? So she said to me, are you serious? Like, uh, and then, uh, but it was very clear that this, this was some kind of... Uh, um, program and plan that had been, that had been staked up to, to the point where then that very same evening then they're separated and they're driven off to various prisons. And Rasha, her mother, and her sister are then sent to a, a detention facility that housed both criminal detainees and immigration detainees. And they ended up staying in both, uh, from that, that, in that one and then in another one for approximately three months in total. And during this time, Rasha had no idea why they were there. She was, she was raised under the American education system. She thinks, this is, this is absolutely not right. This is not supposed to happen. She thinks, this is not justice. This is revenge. At first, she gets very, very angry. And then she gets very depressed. Being in jail is not an easy place to be. And her mother is having a very difficult time uh, assimilating all of this, what's happening. And they're seeing other 9-11, post-9-11 detainees also in the prison. There's a, one woman comes out of the shower always with, her, with a towel wrapped around her head. And Rasha's mother says to Rasha and her sister, maybe she's Muslim. And they run into her and they talk to her. And it turns out she was an Egyptian woman who had also been caught up in the same kind of dragnet. And then Rasha and her, and her whole family had also essentially just disappeared off of the face of the earth at this point. Nobody knew where they had gone. Rasha's sister at this point was a, was a student at a college in Upper Manhattan. And her friends at college then were wondering where she was. And they began a petition. And they started to look for her. And at the same time, there had been an executive order that had been had, that, from the Justice Department that had come down that said that, that the, the uh, prisons were not allowed to disseminate the names of the people who had been arrested in these early sweeps. Uh, so there was no way of knowing officially who was actually in jail, because that's usually what happens in this situation. Instead, what happened is a bunch of lawyers would end up camping out in front of the jails, and whenever anybody left the jail, they would say, okay, do you remember the names of anybody who's in there so you, we can match up the names of the people who have just disappeared? It was an incredible moment. And it, only later on then, did, because of the sis his sister's friend's efforts and some of the efforts of some attorneys in the New York City area, was, were Russia and her family identified. 
And finally, after about three months, then they were subsequently released. And after about three months, as they were released, the men looking over their paperwork said, oh yeah, you have a credible claim of asylum here, as he was let them go. And then they ended up going back to their house and they, the same house that they'd left three months ago, and it looked exactly the same, with just a thin film of dust covering all of the furniture. And, and nobody in the family wanted to talk about the situation afterwards. And yet with Russia, she, at that time, she was resolved that this never should happen to anyone again. And she wanted to enter a human rights program to try to make something positive out of this terrible experience. Or you have the situation, for example, of uh, Yasmin. Yasmin was a young Filipino-American woman, half Filip her mother's Filipino, her father's Egyptian, uh, sorry, Filipino-Egyptian woman, and, um, and she uh, uh, grew up in a fairly religious family. She wore hijab growing up all the time. Her father had sent her to a re religious school. But when he got to high school, he thought, I want uh, Yasmin not to go to the Muslim high school, the private Muslim high school, but I want her to go to the public school because that's probably a better education, he thought, for her. And he wanted her to go to medical school. That was his big plan for her. So Yasmin is, uh, uh, she's like in stature, she's very small and petite, but she's, she's also very feisty and she's very ambitious. And as she's walking through the corridors of her high school in that very first week, she sees that there's, going, there's a student government and that there, uh, there are gonna be elections for student government coming up. And she thinks, oh, I should run for student government. Then she thinks, ah, nobody's gonna vote for the girl in hijab. But then she thinks, I'll do it anyway. So then she does, ends up running for student government. She thinks, I can't run for president. That's too ambitious. Vice president, too ambitious. Maybe secretary, because she's just a freshman. So she runs for secretary. And in their student government, they have all kinds of like, you know, the high school equivalent of campaign finance rules, right? Because like you have to get these petitions that enable you to get on the ballot. And they, all the petitions have to be signed in pen and not pencil. And they can't be photocopied and these sorts of things. And posters have to be put up on the walls in certain ways, et cetera, et cetera, right? Anyway, so Yasmin runs for this position. And then, uh, uh, not sure what's going to happen to her, and then finally, the, uh, she gets a call from the COSA. He's the COSA, the Coordinator of Student Affairs. So the COSA calls her and he says, congratulations, you've won. And she thinks, oh, this is great. This, and this confirms everything that she'd been taught about American democracy, right? And so she, here she is now as the, the secretary. So that summer, she has to do some training to become the secretary of the school. So she's in a, 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 the, the, she also has to take a leadership class that includes all of student government. So in the few weeks before the semester begins, she's there in this class. And uh, some of the other girls are sitting around the table. And they say to her, oh, are you excited about the first event, the school dance? And then she says, oh, well, I don't go to dances. You know, I'm, I'm religious. I don't go to school dances. And they say, oh, well, you know, does the COSA know that? And she says, oh, well, I, I don't think he'll mind. He'll understand. And uh, then they say, well, I don't know. You better tell the COSA. So she goes into the COSA's office. And she says, I understand that there's the school dances, but I can't go because it's against my religion. To which he responds, hmm, well, you know, when you signed the sheet that said that you were going to be the secretary, one clause of that said that you, were, you had to attend all school functions, which includes the school dance. So he, she says, oh, well, I mean, uh, I can't do that because that's against my religion. Says, well, he, the clause says you have to do that. And she says, well, maybe I can like, help set up and take down, but I won't be there for the dance. He's like, no. So they go back and forth, at which point then he says, bring in your father, which everyone knows is not going to go well. Mm -hmm. right? So her father comes armed with a local imam. And this is an African-American imam who grew up in Brooklyn. And he's like, I know what happens in those high school dances. She is not going to those high school dances. <laughs> All right, so they have this big like, battle in there. And Yasmin is actually just waiting. And then they come out. And essentially what happens is the school forces Yasmin to resign her position. And Yasmin thinks that this is a great injustice to her. And she's like starting to post on bulletin boards and things like that, you know, these like high school bulletin boards saying, you know, this happened to me. Why? This, this is not right. And people wrote back and they're like, well, you know, if you can only do half the job and somebody can do the whole job, then maybe that's right. And she's like, you don't understand. The prin there's a principle at stake. But she couldn't quite articulate what the principle was. And she was very upset. Nobody was taking her seriously. Her father just said, get over it. You know, you're going to go to medical school. Get over it. She was so upset. She went to the library. She got out books like Sue the Bastards and Law for Dummies. Those were the two books she got out. She re learned about the statute of limitations, how she only had a limited amount of time if she wanted to file a lawsuit. She starts thinking about how she could file a lawsuit. And she convinces her father that this might be something that he, that he could do. Eventually, they actually find 
find an attorney who might be interested, a local uh, Muslim attorney who might be interested in the case, they go talk to him and he gives her some advice. He's like, because she's still in this class, that's this leadership class, which is made up of people who are in student government and not. So they still talk a lot about student government functions in this class. So he tells her, anytime anybody says anything relevant to your case, you make a note of it and date it. So she's like, okay, okay, okay. So she does that. And then, but then he says, okay, this is, a, this is probably a very good case. Let's talk about my retainer. So he starts talking about how much it's going to cost. It would cost this much if they go to this court. If it gets appealed, it'll cost this much more. And then this much more. The father gets scared. He's like, I have four daughters. I can't, this can't be the case. So I have to put all of them through school. She's so bereft once more. She has no, nothing to hang on to. And then one day she goes to see with her mother and her sister, they go see a movie just out of uh, uh, you know, a change of pace. They go see the movie, which is now an old movie, uh, called I Am Sam. You know that movie? Yeah. With Sean Penn, yeah. right? And so Sean Penn is this very good father, but it seems like he might not be a very good father, and the courts want to take away his child from him. And so he tries to get Michelle Pfeiffer, who's this really high-powered attorney, to like, you know, advocate for him. And Michelle Pfeiffer doesn't want to at first, and then he embarrasses her. And then she says, OK, OK, I'll take your case pro bono. And, she, and Sean Penn looks at her like, what? She goes, pro bono, it means for free. And then she says, he says, for free, and he starts jumping around. A lawyer for free, a lawyer for free. And in all of her legal research, Yasmin had never come across the word pro bono. So now she's thinking, a lawyer for free? So she goes home, opens her computer, starts typing into the computer, pro bono, et cetera, et cetera. And she finds this group called Advocates for Children in New York City, which, as the name says, advocates for children. She calls them up without her father. And they say, oh, this, is, this sounds interesting. She gets a meeting with one of the staff attorneys. The staff attorney looks over the case, all the case files, all of her notes that she's taken very meticulously and says, this is ridiculous, partly because the school, had, while not giving her accommodation, had allowed uh, Greek students to, get, to take off uh, functions for Greek Easter, had allowed Jewish students to take off functions for Jewish holidays, and had allowed one girl to take off functions for her Sweet Sixteen party. So of course then, the lawyer then calls up the school and threatens a lawsuit. And during this time, it's been several years about this point, the school has even added more language to the, uh, to the agreement to uh, run for student government, so it became even more impossible to run. Yes, mean uh, the this lawyer threatens the lawsuit. They immediately, they immediately cave. The school immediately caves. And then Yasmin is able then to run just in time for school president. So then she goes back to the school and she engages on this presidential campaign. She's running against this guy who's the most, he's like a natural born politician. He's like the Bill Clinton of Fort Hamilton High School. And, uh, and then I won't tell you who wins that, so then you'll read the book. Okay. And then, um, but hers is an interesting situation for, uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, and then, very briefly, I'll tell you the, the story of Omar. Omar uh, is half Palestinian, half Chilean, identifies very strongly with his Palestinian side, multilingual, uh, very talented, very interested in media and communications. In fact, he was a student uh, at, uh, in his undergraduate uh, communications major, and while there, he got an uh, internship uh, with Al Jazeera at the UN. And he loved this job with Al Jazeera. Uh, uh, and he was doing all kinds of stuff. He was learning all about how to be a great journalist, and he had all of these connections, and he was like, really just thought that he was really going to launch his career. And he really wanted his career to launch because he was in love with a woman. Uh, and also a, pal a Palestinian woman also from Brooklyn, and who he knew that he couldn't approach her for marriage unless he had a good career job. So he really wanted to get this media job so that he could then get married. So then after he graduates, because that was just an internship, so after he graduates, then he sends out a bunch of resumes to different media organizations to get a job. And he doesn't hear a thing. Then he sends out a whole bunch of other resumes, even, as he said to me, even to Fox News. Right? And he still doesn't hear anything back. More and more resumes, all the time. Nothing, nothing, nothing. At one point, he had a, uh, a small job set up through his father, a summer job, with a woman who was running a local organization. And so he was, he was talking to her. She was interviewing him for the job. Had nothing to do with media. But she's looking over his resume. And his resume says Al Jazeera, because she, he was also very proud of that. 
And she says to him, you know, Ahmed, maybe if you want to get a media job in the U.S., maybe you shouldn't put Al Jazeera there. And with enormous amount of self-pain, he takes it off and puts media consultant. And he still doesn't get a job. And he doesn't know why. And nobody knows why. And he's stuck because he really wants to think that it's not employment discrimination. Because in a way, that would mean that it's something beyond his control. Right? But at the same time, it's always nagging at him. And he's stuck in that in-between zone. Is it this or is it that? And Omar, in a lot of ways, is not, it's not irrational. You know, there was a study done by this group, the Discrimination Resource Center in California had done the study years ago, where they sent around 5,000 similarly qualified resumes across the state of California. But the resumes were fake. There were no real people attached to them. They had test marketed the names beforehand to be ethnically identifiable, because they wanted to see who had the best chance of getting a job, who had the worst. And you had the best chance of getting a job if your name was, what do you think? John Smith? Oh, have a bit more imagination, people. <laughs> Heidi McKenzie. You had the worst chance of getting a job if your name was Abdulaziz Mansour. <laughs> right? So he's not irrational. So that became, you know, there are several other stories in the book, but those are the kinds of stories that, that, that are found there. These are people who I think are living through a moment where there's an ideological formation happening right in their lives. And they're, they're the ones who actually have to, in a, in a very real experiential way, have to live with it. But unfortunately, as I was saying earlier, things have only gotten much worse since 2008. And they've gotten worse in palpable ways. Right? And They've gotten worse even before the 2016 election. Under, Donald, under uh, George W. Bush, we had this, the program of what's called, what was called special registration, or NSEERS officially, which is a program that meant that, that um, uh, men and boys, because there was anybody, any male over the age of 16 who came from 24 Muslim majority countries in North Korea, all had to register their whereabouts with the government. That itself was a program that created the Muslim American ideologically as well. We had the program of special registration in, in, in 2002, it began. We had large scale sweep arrests like we saw with Russia and her family. We had uh, 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 all kinds of state repression happening in law enforcement when it came with George W. Bush. By the time we get to Barack Obama, you might have thought that things would have gotten better, but in fact, there was a great continuation of things when it came from the time of Bush to the time of Obama, when it comes to Muslim Americans. Under Obama, there was the continuation of law enforcement strategies that continued to target and stigmatize Muslim American communities, whether that be through FBI entrapment cases or the Countering Violent Extremism program that the Obama administration set out, or another secret program that was run through the Obama administration that the ACLU only found out about because people started coming to them saying, how come we're not getting our green cards or our citizenships? And all these people turned out to be from Muslim countries. There's this program called CARP, which was a secret program under the United States uh, uh, Immigration Service that was delaying or denying applications from people from 21 Muslim countries. And then, in fact, it, it impacted around 21,000 people. This was under the Obama administration. Right? And then, of course, we get to the 2016 election. And we get to Donald J. Trump. And people talk about Trump as if it was something that was incredibly surprising or terribly new. But I think if you know the history of what's happened up until now, you know that what Donald Trump did was in fact really, he spoke the Islamophobia that was already in practice. Right? And with that speaking the Islamophobia, he in fact laid bare the ways in which Islamophobia and in fact the creation of the Muslim American is not just an ethnic creation or an identity creation. It's a creation that's been instrumentalized into our politics, into our political system itself. And it's in become instrumentalized more and more and more since the year 2001 
until to the year that we have right now, 2017. And it's a, it's a very curious instrumentalization because it's as if it's the creation of the Muslim, the, the, the creation of the Muslim American exists in order to constantly exterminate Muslims or exclude Muslims. It's a kind of constant creation in order to relegate them away. And I think the most, the clearest, so you see that with the special registration, which was a way of purging certain Muslim populations from the, popula from the public with the Obama citizenship program that I just mentioned. And ultimately, you finally see it now in the manifestation of, as we all know, the Muslim ban. So the Muslim ban does not come out of nowhere, is what I want to argue. And I think that it's really important to understand how it's connected to other parts of our political system so that we don't exceptionalize Donald Trump. Right. And what it means, though, and I'll just conclude with this because I know I'm going on for a while here. But I think that what it really means, though, is an understanding that, that Muslim Americans, the ideological construction of Muslim Americans is in many ways, it's a harbinger of things to come. It's a harbinger of things to come in ways of how you manage a pluralistic society. You know, you keep creating difference in ways to exclude people and difference. You, it's how to harbinger a pluralistic society built on stoking fears of difference and built on inconclusive wars. It's built on inconclusive wars at the same time. What it means too is that Muslim Americans become this new category that also uh, will remove them from any other type of individual that they are. Because Muslim Americans are everything else as well, right? You can be African American and Muslim American. You can be Arab American and Muslim American. You can be gay Muslim American. You can be straight Muslim American. You can be rich or poor. You can be documented, undocumented. You are everything because every part of Muslim America is part of American life. So I think the ways to counteract this ideological formation of the Muslim American in general is to make sure that we do not see ourselves only as one category, that we understand ourselves, each of us, and connect to each other on all our various formations. Right? We are interdependent, as James Baldwin once said. No individual can live alone. No nation can live alone. I think he was right. And I'll end on this sentence from Baldwin, which when he says that we must all learn to live together as brothers, or we will all perish together as fools. This is the challenge of the hour. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Sure, okay. <clears throat> so um, I'm not a sociologist. I just play one on TV, <laughs> for the record. Uh, because in fact, the way that I approached the book was, uh, I think through the, the, if you wanted to give it a professional label, I would say as a literary journalist, as a journalist writing in a more literary fashion, right? And so there's a long tradition of literary journalism. So it was out of that. But I think that what you see is in a lot of, you know, especially the, the social sciences and journalism, there's a lot of overlap in their methodologies. Yeah. And so I think that there's a way in which anthropologists can see what uh, there are, the ways in which I've written the book connects to what they're saying and doing also with sociologists. Also, incidentally, with oral historians. And I, I, I've given talks, for example, at Columbia University's Oral History Institute. And I remember the last, I've given two talks there. And I remember the last talk, 
was, a, uh, was with a bunch of their, um, their oral historian class and they were all really interested in how I conducted the interviews and like where the tapes were for the interviews that I had recorded because I recorded some of them but not all of them and these sorts of things and like just talking to me as if like I'm an oral historian who doesn't even know it you know and then they and then they asked me about like the writing process and I said well yes what I would do then is I would also you know I would I would make an arc out of the story because people don't always you know, people never really talk linearly, right? They talk in the different kinds of fact. They go backwards and forwards and these sorts of things. And you go, you know, so I, would, I was arcing the story, although I was using their words and I was very, it was very, I was very uh, um, uh, precise in, using, in, in staying to what they were saying to me, but I would still create that arc. And at that point, they said, oh, you're not an oral historian. You're a journalist at that point. So yes, there are differences. And, uh, you know, I think that the limitation with the snowball sample is clear because you're not, you're looking with a small, with a relatively small sample versus like a really large scale um, um, study. Um, it's also the difference between, on that very fundamental level between, I guess, qualitative and quantitative work in that regard too. Uh, and also, you know, I was driven very much by narrative and I have that prerogative because I was looking at it as a journalist. And so I wanted, to write, I wanted to write the best stories that I could based on the people's stories, but also stories that I felt were uh, hit, hitting the important um, issues that I felt were the important issues for the community. And so I, I kind of meshed those two questions together. What were the issues and what, what are the stories that I have? Whereas, you know, people could argue that, well, the, the, you know, it ends up that there's a lot of people who, have, who are uh, Palestinian descent in the book and not Moroccan, for example. And there's a sizable Moroccan population in, uh, in New York City. So maybe you'll get upset if like, you're a Moroccan and you don't see that you're. But I, wasn't, I made, said from the very beginning that you know, it's the story that's going to determine this, not a kind of uh, trying to be fair to like, a, a certain objective demography. So if things get missed out of that, then I think my answer to that is, there are plenty of space for other books to be written at the same time. So, Dr. Hui. So, uh, first of all, I, I'm going to take the uh, liberty of disagreeing just a little bit with your narrative while agreeing with your conclusion. Maybe because unlike you who know you were young once, I can think of <laughs> <laughs> So, most of the, the, the slightest agreement I have is that this started before 9-11, and, and for me, because I'm older, I think it started with the Iran hostage crisis. Right. It was the first time in my life that I remember people stopping you on the street saying, are you Iranian? Are you Muslim? Yeah. Are you from Europe? And it was, uh, you know, my older cousin had a great way of talking. She said, actually, I'm Algerian, and you owe me. <laughs> but to be at least from my perspective, the first time I remember the exclusionary language being used far more effectively than with, with Mr. Trump, who's, who's in a way, because he's such a polarizing figure, yeah. something of an inadvertent unifier, at least of a larger group of people mm -hmm. than, than pre election, is with, with President Reagan, who was, a, from my perspective, a far more pol dangerous polarizing figure. Mm -hmm. because with his narrative of it's morning in America, oh, it's the cities, oh, it's these people. He brought forth for the first time that I can recall, even Nixon was nowhere near as effective, mm -hmm. very much an us versus them narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you know, with the spiritual. And because I was a student in the 80s, I remember my friends who were five kids in my class who were African Americans. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, we've been dining all here you are at Yale, the mm -hmm. university that gave Martin Luther King. An honorary degree when he was in jail. They said, "You Arab boy, come sit with us. These other guys don't want you." Mm. And a couple of these relationships I've maintained for thirty plus years. Mm -hmm. No fault of theirs. I'm not great at keeping in touch. But from my perspective, I see the momentum building, mm -hmm. and my frustration for this sort of very effective stereotyping of groups, most effective against Muslim Americans. I agree. With you. Yeah. But I remember one of the effective ways that Martin Luther King used to deal with it, which is you know, he wrapped himself in fundamental American values, or at least what people like to think are fundamental American values. They may not be really the American. One of the fundamental American values we hope for is inclusiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Open-mindedness. Turned out maybe 
<laughs> as we'd like. Um, and I'm riveted by these demonstrations by the NFL yeah. and other players and how badly they're playing even with individuals who would be otherwise very sympathetic. So my tough question is you, to you is, mm -hmm. is it more important to win on principle or just to mm -hmm. stand firmly on principle? Because that's, I think, one of the challenges in the, mm -hmm. in the era. And I completely agree with your narrative yeah. about the Obama era. I think it was a, a strong continuation of the exclusionary yes. uh, issue. Because from a personal perspective, yeah. A couple of presentations that I had that were major presentations. Yeah. I got asked to give them to someone else. And as a junior faculty, the last thing you want is, you know, imagine if I say, Adam, here's your great publication, let someone else present. Right. And my question when I was in Texas and Atlanta was, but I know the data, I generated the data, and the, and the was, you know, someone else would get more publicity. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing, the worst advice I would get from a friend is, Tell them you're a Christian. I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Talking about we're in academia. So the question is specifically because of this, how do you win? Because Martin Luther King, from my perspective, he won. He, mm -hmm. he created momentum and it was a successful movement for civil rights. Mm -hmm. How do you win without giving up your principles? So there's a lot to unpack there, actually. And let me just say first, um, that I'm kind of, uh, I'm driven by uh, Raymond Williams' notion of culture. And so Raymond Williams, the, the, you know, the, the Marxist uh, uh, cultural theorist from Cambridge, the way that he talks, the way that culture operates is that at any given moment in culture, you have, you'll have dominant, residual, and emergent elements. Right? And so it's an important to understand when something is residual, when something is the dominant element of the, of the era, and when something is emerging. Right? And I think that that's important to as a way of understanding periodization. Because I think that we can always find antecedents for anything at any time. But I do think that there's a moment in 2001 and after when this anti-Islamophobia this Islamophobia and this anti-Muslim sentiment actually gets instrumentalized into the domestic politics of the United States that's, actually, that's really fundamentally different than what it was from before. So I, I acknowledge all of those earlier uh, moments, and many of them are dominant for a certain foreign policy footing of the United States at certain moments, but when it comes to the kinds of things that I'm discussing right now, I feel like what they are, they're, they're in the emergent phase rather than the dominant phase then. And so you have the dominant phase beginning, you could say, in the post-9-11 era. So uh, I think that's important because you can always find antecedents. If we go back to the Iran uh, uh, hostage crisis, we could, we could probably go back to the 67 war. We could, we could keep going back, in other words, right? And so this is what periodizing I think is important. And I think Raymond Williams really gives me the structure of which, by which I can like, think through that question. But now the question of like, how do you win? Um, well, uh, let me tell you three easy steps. I mean, <laughs> right? It's a very difficult question. It's an impossible, in many ways, it's an impossible question to a answer. And the reason why it's an impossible question to answer is because you never win. Because, and I say that because the, the fight is constant. The struggle is constant. And so there will never be a time when you emerge victorious and somebody else is defeated. There's a, only a time when you are on the, you know... Yes, you are, you are dominant and they're, they're a residual or the, you know, the same sort of thing. They're recede, their power recedes as yours emerges. And so those sorts of things are really important to acknowledge. Those are important to acknowledge also just from a, a, an activist point of view too because it means that your efforts have to be engaged constantly too. And it means that it becomes a way of, in, in fact, it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes a way of living. And I think that's fine because it means that you're, in effect, you know, I think advice, if I had any advice to give to young activists, it's that, you know, it's that you actually become uh, the thing that you want to be by trying to be that thing. Like, you know, in their action of trying to change society is where they're discovering that change itself, right? And so, um, in, in other words, that it has to be a constant push on the, the, on the pressures on uh, and the powers of society, because they, nobody is, uh, you know, now almost a uh, cliched comment from Frederick Douglass is that no you know, power doesn't give itself up uh, uh, voluntarily. But I think it's really important to, even in this, in these, what is it now, uh, 10 months that we've had or so of the, of the uh, new administration, 
to understand that we've had enormous shifts even within those 10 months. And I'll give you an example. Um, and this is one that I think everybody is very familiar with and one that I, I personally had lived through too because it, when the, the Muslim ban first came down in January 27th, right, you saw thousands of people out. And it was so inspiring. I know people who organized the demonstrations in New York City, and they had no idea that it would, they were going to be that big. Like they were, there was a network already established to get people uh, motivated and to get them activated. But they thought they would get maybe 500, at most 1,000 people coming out to the airport. And what you saw in New York City was you know, within an hour, there was like 2,000. And then a few hours later, there was like 5,000. Somebody from Long Island sent pizzas because he couldn't come there, so they wanted to feed the people who were there. By the end, there were 10,000 people there. And that was just at, at JFK. They were, and this happened spontaneously at airports across the country. So there was something so beautiful and inspiring on the pushback from that. And it was beautiful and inspiring also because the courts were watching and were listening. You know, the courts, we have this idea, I think, in the United States that, that the rule of law is somehow separate from the pressures of the street. And I think that's bunk. I think that's completely not true. And so you saw that it gave cover to a lot of the federal judges, actually, to rule and find that the Muslim ban was itself unconstitutional. And you kept on seeing, you kept on seeing a lot of that pressure there uh, uh, in different street protests, especially in January and February. And then, then the courts started ruling, and you started to see the street protests recede. Right? And then finally, when the court, the Supreme Court, ruled in the summer that the Muslim ban would be essentially allowable, although with various exceptions. Now it depends on how you read it. I see that as a terrible ruling. I see it as a ruling that enabled the fact that there was now wholesale um, exclusion of people based on their nationality alone, which is something that we haven't, and, and that nationality is based essentially on our national prejudice like the exclusion of them, something we haven't really seen in the United States since the Asian exclusion laws. I see it as a retrograde moment in American politics that really should have, again, mobilized tens of thousands of people onto the streets. And it didn't. And it's deeply concerning to me. And I think that what happened was that we have this, we continue to have this massive amount of faith in the rule of law and the structures of the law to preserve and find, like, to, to, that they'll do the right thing. Instead of understanding that law also preserves the power and the status quo in many ways. So the, in fact, our dependence on the rule of law sucked out all of the activist energy in this one very important case. And you know, we continue to see different issues that, that Mr. Trump himself brings to the table, these cultural issues that he brings to the table, at the same time that, you know, other economic or, or uh, political issues are being performed. Sometimes I feel like the population gets plagued by these, pop, pop, these cultural issues at the same time. So I think being, you know, knowing how to be active, knowing where to be on the streets, knowing when to push, knowing how to motivate people, that's the only way there's going to be movement forward, I think. And I'm not saying that it's easy. I wish that it were. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of good, uh, honest desire to combat uh, the, the, mo the most pernicious aspect of this administration from many corners of American society. I see that as, a, as generally a very good thing. And the way that I was trying to end my talk today was that you know, if we each understand our complicatedness and our relationships to each other in more complicated ways than just seeing us as you are this, you are that, you are this, and you are that, then there's more opportunity for that kind of organization and, 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 uh, and opposition to, to the government. Thank you for the great agent. Let me think whether this new category of exclusion is it a very special category or it just happens to be the category of our country? There's something very special about it, different from the previous. That's a good question. I think there is something special about it. Um, you know, previous categories have been based on, like you could say, uh, for example, often nation-based, right? So it'll be, we hear a lot of talk against North Korea now, for example. That's a different kind of category. Um, or in pre previous parts of American history, you might have had uh, 
uh, Japanese Americans, or even the the uh, the Red Scare or Yellow Peril, and these sorts of formations, mm -hmm. right? But there's something a little bit different about Muslim American, at least in our time, um, because I feel like what Muslim American does, or Mus it's really Muslim and its component domestically is Muslim American, and it actually seems to satisfy almost every anxiety that the United States has at any given moment. So it's an anxiety that's about security, national security, right? It's an anxiety about multiculturalism and cultural influence because all those anti-Sharia law movements and all the sense that, you know, if we wake up on Tuesday, the Constitution is going to be usurped by, by the, you know, the Sharia. Uh, the, the, and people on the right wing, they actually believe this, at least in, in like more than 32 states, um, they've passed anti-Sharia law legislation, uh, which is completely ludicrous, but it illustrates that there's also this culture, they believe that there's a kind of cultural threat as well as a national security one, right? And then there's a kind of like immigration threat that you see manifest in the idea that people can't even come into the border, something that attaches a lot to say uh, 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 Mexican Americans and Latino Americans who get scripted into that sort of threat, right? Um, you even get demographic threats uh, that Muslims populate themselves too much and therefore this is going to be a threat to the nature of, of American society as we know it. So there's this way in which I think the category of Muslim Americans really functions like across a lot of the threat levels in our society at the same time. Um, and also, importantly, the idea of Muslim is so global too, right? And so it's a kind of globalized threat. It's very abstract, whereas uh, in some ways, maybe the Red Scare had some measure of that too, right? Um, uh, but uh, a lot of the other ones are geographically very distinct. But uh, uh, so I think it's a kind of amalgamation is what makes it new. Uh, but it certainly has, again, it has its antecedents. So I think that the, the, the way that it's very uh, faith-based or faith identity-based has an antecedents in the way that the Red Scare had very, a very clear anti-Semitic component at the same time, and, and these sorts of things too. So we can like find ways in which it's similar, but I think there is something that's palpably different about it, and that's about the age that we are in. It, it speaks more about the age that we are in than anything. Thank you, very, very interesting. Quite enjoyed it. The uh, link to Nadia's question, uh, don't you think that the fight for the rights of the uh, Muslim Americans will transform this from being a category to an identity in your time and practically as you fight and, and struggle against this label uh, for the, all the reasons that you mentioned, you're actually sort of underscoring it and, 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 and transforming it actually into, into an identity. I, I completely agree with you, and it's one of the, uh, you know, it's something, it's a cautionary note around it, right? And I think a lot of Muslim Americans uh, take up that identity, like, very clearly. Uh, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, if you have a kind of analysis that understands the ways in which identity and politics are in, deeply imbricated, and that identity is not natural, that it's a formation, you know, but I'm not sure that that we have that sophistication always. Um, so, yeah, I think there are ways in which, you know, Muslim American, whether it's being from internally that Muslims themselves are taking on that identity or in, which, in ways in which that identity gets scripted, you know. Like now there's a lot of people who are interested in, for example, Muslim American literature. So like the, my book will fall into that category, for example. I, you know, I know this from many different uh, examples itself. And, and you know, I understand that that's a, you could see that as a kind of category, but it is a kind of, it's ways in which identity formation institutionally and structurally happens. And maybe it leaves out certain ways of like trying to understand how that construction actually happens rather than just assuming it's natural. So I think you're right. I think it's a caution that we have to be aware of. I'm not sure how to combat it with then just more discussion about understanding the ways in which identity formation itself is political. What do you do? I'm sorry, I can't hear, hear you. Oh, uh huh. <laughs>
Thanks. Um, yeah, def I definitely think so. Um, <clears throat> and um, um, you can see it in the polling data. Some of the more, the, if you look at some of the more uh, sophisticated questions or the more uh, complicated questions, they'll they'll correlate that people who believe in uh, greater foreign intervention and believe in the, the the rightness of the wars that the U.S. is involved in in the region also tend to be more Islamophobic. Not surprisingly. Also, incidentally, the people who tend to be more Islamophobic tend to be, um, according to the polling data, also tend to be more um, homophobic and anti-Semitic. Again, probably not surprisingly. And they also tend to be, maybe also not unsurprisingly, Fox News TV watchers, Fox TV news watchers, right? Um, uh, so there's definitely a kind, a specific kind of demographic that's activated by this in the United States. And that demographic has a clear view about the U.S. in its role abroad. So that's on the one side of your question. I completely agree. But, you know, I also think that Islamophobia or this, like, you know, it's a word that I have never really liked, um, but um, is it's not really about fear of Islam. It's more about mobilizing a kind of anti-Muslim uh, belief for certain purposes. And I think that... Uh, you know, when it comes to the region, it gets very complicated, but the war on terror does not exist without a certain vision about what Muslims do and what Muslims are. And, it, and the war on terror does not exist, in fact, really without kind of producing that and reproducing it at the same time, too, right? And so what you get is a reliance on the regimes uh, to allow, and especially as the war becomes, as these wars become interminable and... and uh, uh, you get a reliance, I think, on the regimes in the region to continue uh, for the United States, in a sense. And um, so I think it does get super complicated. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think one of the worst things about the I ideology of the, this war on terror age in which we live in is that it enables a kind of authoritarianism around the world, all in the name of fighting terror. Um, and And... What I'm talking about, I think, is a very clear constituent part of that. Uh, and we can talk about that in the U.S. domestic sphere, but we can talk about it in domestic spheres also around the world. Um, so I think there's op opportunity to try to make those connections. I think they're there. Yes? Yes. In the sense that, which is why sadly you said that we begin and ironically, but both now one of the spent uh, the new anniversary uh, you know, the printing, uh, you know, means that it, things haven't changed all that much on the ground. The one phrase that I did not hear throughout your presentation, maybe because it probably has no place in it, but I would like to add as a possible um, uh, value, the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. 
Many things change in the ground. Yes, mm -hmm. of course, the outcomes have been uh, invariably uh, negative and disappointing, mm -hmm. either disenchanting, perhaps with the exception of Tunisia. But my question to you is the following. On the ground, on the level of the American people, uh, the New Yorkers, mm -hmm. the ones who live in Brooklyn mm -hmm. next to you, the ones who don't necessarily watch Fox News, mm -hmm. did their view, perhaps not on the bureaucratic and political levels, but did their views not change somewhat closer? I mean, did they not move to Mm -hmm. have the opportunity, even on CNN or, via, or Al Jazeera English, to see how Arabs can, in fact, fight for democracy and fight for freedom and take to the streets, which are also American ideals. I mean, was there no change whatsoever on the, uh, on the, on the, on the average American in his or her perception of the Arab American, which is a subset of Western yes. Americans? That's right. my question. Yes. Did you sense any change? Mm -hmm. in, on the highest political level, on, mm -hmm. on the ground, right. on the street level. Yeah, no, it's a good question. But unfortunately, no. <laughs> yes. I mean, maybe for those, the, the, you know, maybe for the month that the uh, Egyptian uh, uprisings were broadcast, like, yeah, Tunisia formerly, but, the, but Egypt was so dramatic, too. I mean, Anderson Cooper got beat up in Dakir yes. Square, for example, right? <laughs> Etc. Etc. Et yeah. So, right. So maybe at that moment there was a lot of interest, and so there was this idea of uh, of um, the conclusion, even of a kind of cultural conclusion of the war on terror. People, there was this very neat sort of like from two thousand and one to two thousand and eleven, right? Yes. Yeah. That's your ten years. That's your ten years. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But that evaporated so quickly, and it didn't evaporate even not so much with uh, in the United States with. Um, with how the, the, the uh, Arab uprisings themselves became so complicated. It just evaporated also with all kinds of different, you know, uh, random terrorist acts around the country, around different countries around the world. So, and I think you cannot, um, you cannot dis diminish how easy it is for, I think, anybody to hold two completely con contradictory thoughts in their, politically contradictory thoughts in their head at the same time and find no, no problem with it. So, for example, um, there was one moment, I remember thinking that, uh, it was, uh, I think it was, uh, there are several moments when I've thought about that. And one was around, around the time of the Arab uprisings, but I've forgotten what the other, like the, the uh, negative example was then. But another one was when, you know, when the passing of Muhammad Ali, the boxer, um, that happened like within days of, was it, was it Charlie Hebdo? Or, was one of, the, one of the big terrorist attacks, I can't recall which one. San Bernardino, maybe it was San Bernardino. And so like within the same week, like you could have the same people on television, you know, or even just among people that I know, like talking, like saying, what a great, not know as in friends, but just like conversations you hear. And they'll say things like, what a great man Muhammad Ali was, you know, he's such a great example of like a Muslim American. Those Muslims are, are crazy and they have to go. Like, and not seeing any contradiction in saying those two things within the span of like the same, almost the same sentence. Because people can hold, I think, contradictory thoughts like at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like Robert. to second what Wally said in terms of you know, your performance skills. Beautiful to see. Um, Barack Hussein uh, Obama and the construction and the birther movement and yes. Trump in the intervening years. Right. I'd just love to hear you talk for a second about that because it seems especially the conflation of black and Muslim that you talked about before, right. the illegitimacy question. I, I love the fact you're doing this on the ground, sort of Raymond Williams ground up kind of analysis, but symbolically some things changed in the U.S., though I was here for a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I wrote an essay in um, 2012 about the 2012 election. And uh, I entitled the essay White with Rage, about 2012. And in the essay, I was thinking about the, um, uh, the Obama-Mitt Romney election. And really, the, not just Romney, but m even more the other Republican candidates who were coming up uh, to, uh, uh, for the nomination, people like... Um, Herman Cain, for example. You remember Herman Cain, the pizza guy, right? 
And Herman Cain, like, said, you know, he would never let a Muslim in his cabinet at one point, or things like that. And like, if you went down the line, all of the major Republican candidates said something that was, like, outrageously Islamophobic uh, during the 2012 election. And the Republican population, like, the, the Republican voters were rabidly, and continue to be rabidly, anti-Barack Obama, and they articulate their anti-Obama-ness through the idea that he's still a secret Muslim, still to this day. Like, you know, back the, like around 2015 or whatever, I think it was 67 or 72 percent, something like around there, of Republicans in some of the southern states still thought that Obama was a secret Muslim. And I think that a lot of that, you know, claiming that secret Muslimness, it's a, it's a deflection of racism. Because you can say that about Obama, and that's a way of being racist against Obama without saying, I don't like him because he's black. Because you still, at least, at least before 2016, you couldn't, still couldn't say that in polite company. Right? But you could say, oh, I don't trust him because of his Muslimness. You can't say, I can't trust him because of his blackness. But you could say, I don't trust him because of his Muslimness. So it's not, this is another interesting thing about Islamophobia, because a lot of it is this deflection of other, of other, of other kinds of racisms at the same time. And so I think that, that you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump is a, a notorious racist. And, like, look at the Central Park Five and, like, other examples. Like, uh, like and these things seem deeply... Uh, I, uh, usually I don't like to personalize politics. I think there are larger structures at stake that determine, like, you know, even how people's personal motivations are crafted and created. But Donald Trump seems like a completely unreconstructed racist to me, like, uh, like frankly speaking. And an unreconstructed Islamophobe. Like, I think that he legitimately, or like, illegitimately, but it's not a performance. I think that he really doesn't like black people, and I think that he really doesn't like Muslim people. Um, and you saw that historically in Trump with the Central Park Five case as an example. And then you, you're right, you see it transform. Like with the, with the Obama birther movement, it's a way of trying to say something about uh, how blackness does not belong in our public sphere, but I'm gonna say it through Islam instead. Um, and that was all the way back in 2012. I mean, the other, the other um, conclusion that I reached when I was writing that piece too was, you know, looking at a lot of the commentary, for example, from a lot of these anti-mosque um, construction folk around the country. And if you listen to what they say, a lot of what they say is, you know, we just want our community to return to the way it was. We don't like the fact that these people are here. We don't have anything against them per se. We just want our community to return to the things the way they were. And so there's a, I think that's a whole lot of white anxiety that's happening in the country too. And white anxiety is related to Islamophobia, but it's not, it's, Islamophobia is one part of it. Like white anxiety has a lot to do with Latinos in the United States, for example, too. So the ways in which like, these different formations get articulated through Islamophobic rhetoric is deeply fascinating to me. And I think it really speaks something a lot about the anxieties of our, of our age. And I saw that kind of white anxiety in, I mean, not that I'm some great soothsayer, but I, I wrote that essay in 2012, and it just seems like an incredibly uh, relevant essay to reread for the, what happened in 2016. Maybe... Uh, one, one brief yeah, question from Ken, and then we can yeah, okay. conclude. Um, I'm wondering about uh, what might be perceived as a methodological contradiction. In the, I'm full of contradictions. <laughs> Seem to apply, and I wonder if that's.
that's not possibly the source of some of this uh, white rage that you mentioned that, as you rightly say, transcends the uh, animosity toward the Arab uh, and Muslim Americans. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder, you know, I mean, I think if you take the figure of ta Coates, for example, who's now become like, you know, a big uh, uh, public intellectual in the United States, the, there's a lot of criticism that comes from, I guess you could say, the white establishment that he's too pessimistic, right, that he sees things too negatively, whereas I think a lot of African Americans would say, well, he sort of sees it how it is, like, you know. Like there's this constant desire in the United States uh, liberal imagination to turn towards optimism. I mean, I feel it in my in my audiences when I speak too. Like, you know, if you don't leave an audience with something optimistic at the end, they feel cheated in the United States. But what? Why? Like, like there's a lot of reason not to be very optimistic. I mean, if you look at the last ten years, for example, what I've been describing is not really very optimistic. You know, how can I now say, you know, but it's just around the corner. You know, like, so I think, you know, uh, I'm not sure that it's a contradiction between, say, Marxism and liberal humanism, because you know, ultimately, even in, in classical Marxism, equality is essentially, you know, that's the pot of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, um, but, um, but I think it might be a kind of tension that you see in American society between sort of optimism and pessimism. And I mean that those terms politically, not emotionally, right? Because you can be politically pessimistic in constructive ways, I think. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not following optimism and pessimism. The point I was trying to make was that if the, those who are operating in a liberal humanist framework are perceiving that the others are looking for dominance as opposed to equality, that could engender feelings of fear and uh, the kinds of uh, animosities that, that you know, you're, you're exploring in your work. And that's, that's basically my question. Yeah. You're certainly not looking for right. Well, I mean, I guess, I, I guess, I, yeah, I guess you're. I think you're describing essentially um, the kind of uh, um, right-wing movements that we see in the country right now, which see themselves as themselves identity movements because they feel like they're losing their place to the other identity movements, right? And so that's definitely there. I guess I was talking more in terms of the not thinking about the right wing and thinking just within the dynamics of the left or liberal left instead. But absolutely, I mean, I, think, I don't think there's any question that we see a resurgent identity politics that's coming not from the left, but in fact that's coming right directly from the right. And my, you know, my argument too, because the right wing also wants to paint identity politics, as do the liberal class, want to paint identity politics as something that's damaging and from the left. Whereas I think identity politics can be very damaging, uh, but there's also opportunities for creating new futures out of it. But identity politics has always been with us since the rise of colonialism. I, mean, I think that colonialism was premised in sense, it, it, itself on a kind of identity politics. So to think of it only as a kind of left-wing um, uh, origin is, I think, foolish and, and it's completely ahistorical. <laughs>